Alrighty, welcome everyone, and thank you, thank you. This is a long anticipated evening. Um, we're so happy to have George Yeager with us tonight. But of course, we have a few announcements first. Um, first of all, I just want to let you know about a program we're going to have next week, one week from tonight, in this very same spot. Um, we will have Meg Mott from um, from Marlborough College, and she's going to be leading a, dis a discussion. Um, she's going to be leading a discussion on the First Amendment. So uh, she's going to sort of unpack the First Amendment for us, and then we'll have a discussion about you know what what are the necessary limits, um, what are the um, expansions, uh, what are the restrictions that um, we would have with the First Amendment. So that is, will be a week from tonight. I hope to see all of you back for that. Uh, and then in July, we'll be talking about the Second and Third Amendments. So that would be fun, too. Um, also, we are having a book group that is led by um, the Rich Earth, Earth Institute, and it's talking about you know, how to best serve the environment um, around the issues of human waste. So you can read the books and come and have a discussion, and there will also be potlucks. So. Uh, and then also, um, two weeks from this past Monday, we will have a community sing, we'll have live music, and uh, and lyrics, and everybody comes, and everybody sings, and it's great, because, because so many people are singing, you can't hear me singing, so that's really nice. <laughs> it still gives me a chance to sing. Um, okay, so tonight, to the program at hand, um, of course, we have many people to thank for this. We have statewide underwriters, the Alma Gibbs Donchin Foundation, the Wyndham Foundation, the Institute of Museum and Library Sciences, and the uh, Vermont Department of Libraries. And then we have our statewide underwriters, uh, or our program underwriters, which are the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation in partnership with the Pulitzer Prizes, Chroma Technology, who is underwriting this very, <laughs> you're wired. Everybody can hear what you're saying. <laughs> um, and uh, Chroma Technology, who is, uh, it, it, who is underwriting this very program. Um, the Crosby Gannett Fund, Carol and Jeff Gaddis, who we know, who come to these lectures frequently, the Vermont Bar Association, and then our local library sponsors, who are Against the Grain, Brattleboro Auto Body and Detailing, the Brattleboro Food Co-op, Brattleboro Savings and Loan, and Park Place Financial, right there, you can see them, and New Chapter, the Richards Group, and the Wyndham World Affairs Council. So, finally, um, <laughs> we are so lucky tonight to have former American diplomat George Yeager. His long career spanned the Cold War and beyond. Uh, after early assignments in Liberia and Tito's Yugoslavia, he served in the U.S. mission in Berlin, negotiated the Non-Proliferation Treaty in Bonn, and covered East-West relationships in, er, relations in Paris. He was the political advisor in Ottawa, American Consul General in Quebec during the independence crisis, and taught foreign affairs as diplomat in residence at Middlebury College. And among George's most challenging assignments were his three years as staff director of the President's Advisory Commission on Arms Control and Disarmament. His stint as a senior negotiator of the Helsinki Final Act in Geneva and his final tour as Deputy Assistant Secretary General of NATO and Chairman of the Alliance's Political Committee under Lord Carrington in Brussels. Since he has retired, George has been an international consultant, supervised elections in post-war Bosnia and Kosovo, and has continued to teach and lecture frequently on foreign affairs. So finally, at last, let's have a big hand for George Yeager. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm sorry I butted into your introduction. <laughs> That's all right. Luckily, it wasn't anything too interesting. No, it's <laughs> Can we make this a little higher? Oh, we can. Yes. I'm going to have to have you hop off. Okay. 
The reason I'm hobbling around is I had a hip replacement, and the surgeon made this leg too long. So I'm continually off balance. But we're going to fix that. Is that, a, is that a little bit better? Okay. Maybe I'll start with a with 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 a, with a sort of procedural comment. Um, most foreign affairs lectures are about something. They're about Syria, or they're about Yugoslavia, or about the iniquities of the current Secretary of State, or you, you name it. Uh, people use lectures like this to show how many secrets of the CIA they can share with the public at large, uh, because they're so very knowledgeable and plugged in. And the, the frequent net result of this is that people go away and say, well, now I know a little bit more about Somalia. But how the hell does it all hang together and where is it going? Haven't you had that experience? The newspapers, I think I've just lost my... No, no you're, fine. you're fine. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. You know, the newspapers do this continually, and they give you more and more detail about very specific issues. And yet, unless you see the bigger picture, let's say you go from the Sudan to the Middle East, and then and you see, they look finally at the still bigger picture, uh, and that is that you go from the Middle East to the world, and then you go to one more big, one even bigger picture, and that is where are we going? It's not where we are that's the most important question. The most important question in the management of power of a great nation is where are we going? Where is this ship, where is this boat heading to? And that's almost never discussed. I, I, we were just talking here a minute ago uh, about the great change that has taken place. Since I cranked the mimeograph machine in Dean Atchison's office when I was down there on a, on a summer internship. And you know, these were all top secret papers, and I was the kid with the dirty black fingers. And all these very important, intelligent looking people were going hither and thither and going to meetings and writing things and what have you. And then I began reading when I was mimeographing. And I suddenly discovered that what they were all exchanging papers about in the policy planning staff is where America and the world were going to go after World War II. It was an intense, ongoing, devoted discussion on the biggest picture, on subsets of the biggest picture, on projections here, projections there. And that's why Dean Atchison and Harry Truman were so well served, because we had a conceptual framework uh, of where this country was, where, where, where it was best that, we, that this country be led to and go. And the amazing thing is that after 40 years, the policy of containment, which was the label put on this whole framework of policies, in which these people produced, succeeded. And as George Cannon, the original the sort of driving force behind much of this, said, you don't want to have a World War III to deal with the Soviet Union. You don't want to give in to the Soviet Union. So the policy is to build a framework and let them push against you. That's much more efficient than us pushing against them. And believe it or not, it worked. Ronald Reagan took credit for it. Uh, bless his heart. But he didn't dream this up, and he didn't implement it over 40 years, and we made some horrible mistakes. 
which almost derailed it. Uh, but there we are. Now, that, that's sort of the, the introduction to what's going to get even more serious, because I'm going to talk about that highest level of policy and what we're facing in this period in which we're in and why we're all screwed up. <laughs> Can I put that colloquially? Very undiplomatic. Uh, and I made, I'm, I'm going to work from a text because precision in linking ideas is so important. And therefore, it, it's, ad libbing it is, is more fun. But, follow, but I want you to follow the ideas. And then afterwards, let's take it apart. And if you think I'm crazy, tell me so. And we'll, but we'll discuss any and all aspects of it, OK? OK. I think the starting point is that we are living in a, at a fateful turning point of history. When you look back in history, we're pretty good at identifying the fateful turning points when Rome's fate became wobbly. You know, when the various other empires met their reached. And I think what, what, what strikes me about the period we're living in now is we are living at a fateful turning point of history. And if the humanity survives another few hundred years, they will look back on this period and say, well, that thing, that's when things really moved. OK? Now, since the fall of the USSR three decades ago, which was the result of brilliant American statesmanship in the post-World War II period, we came to believe that we were and would remain the uncontested leaders of the world the free world, as we call it, until recently. We were the city on the hill, the good guys destined to bring the blessings of democracy to the four corners of the world. Go out on the marketplace and say loudly, no, we're not, and see what happens. We still believe it. I'm going to stand up because this chair is too long. But instead of peace, these decades have seen us embroiled in endless, enormously expensive and counterproductive wars in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Syria, by proxy in Yemen, wars which in turn produced costly blowback, was very predictable, in the form of ISIS and other militant Muslim movements with which we're still struggling. Current White House agitation against Iran could lead to one more such war, an even more destructive Middle East affair, which Trump, looking at his election prospects, is, seems to be trying to damp down with statements the other day that he is willing to enter into unconditional talks with Tehran and doesn't want war, but he remains ambiguous and his national security advisor, John Bolton, is beating the war drums and waggling his mustache as vigorously as he knows how. So let's hope we skip that potential war. In the meantime, our defense budget has ballooned to astronomic levels. Everybody knows that, but it's, it's terribly important to underscore it. It currently absorbs 53 cents of every tax dollar you, you and I pay. 53 cents. And as Harper's, and has become, as Harper's Magazine just put it, a self-generating organism. The, 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 nobody understands the defense budget anymore. Nobody o oversees it anymore. It, it's, it's like an octopus with many arms, and it just keeps evolving and transforming itself. <laughs> and it's preempting the funds which we desperately need to meet the social needs of our country and to bring our failing infrastructure up to date.
The irony is, that's the point of reciting the obvious, the irony is that in this vast ongoing expenditure of blood and treasure, this, uh, this expenditure of blood and treasure has not prepared us to deal with the quite predictable challenges with which we are now actually faced. You know, it's shooting off in the wrong directions. For it is not terrorists or rogue Middle Eastern states, but a fundamental change in world power relationships, which is seriously challenging our primacy. A challenge for which it turns out we're intellectually, emotionally, and militarily ill-prepared. For while we were celebrating and not paying attention, Russia recovered as a major military power. And even more importantly, China emerged on the world scene like a waiting giant. In 40 short years, it overcame the multiple disasters which befell it in the 19th century, in World War II, and in the Mao Zedong era to become a major, new, and still growing world power, which is now seriously challenging American primacy and may soon surpass us. I just said something very important, which is now seriously challenging American primacy and may shortly surpass us. It's precisely the situation foreseen in Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War, which many of you will be familiar with, <coughs> almost 2,500 years ago, in which Graham Allison of Harvard famously dubbed the Thucydides Trap. How many of you have heard of him? A few, okay. Sparta was the established power. Athens was the new kid on the block. They were a sea power, they developed their strength, and they began rocking Sparta's boat. Sparta didn't like it. They started retaliating tangentially. And instead of settling the hash, which is the point of this lecture, they had a war, which nobody won. And that's why it's called the Thucydides Trap. Because the Thucydides Trap is the situation when there is a rising power and, a, and an established power. And it's very much like in families, when all of a sudden there's a new, more powerful relative, there's usually trouble in the family. Because people don't like it when their boat gets rocked. Well, that's what this is all about. And the reason we're in this extraordinarily, in this extraordinary turning point of history is because we're now in the very center of what the Thucydides trap is all about. The central question of our time is whether we too are going to fall into this trap. or if we can find a way to avoid what could become a truly cataclysmic confrontation with a now very powerful China and its allies from which no one will emerge unscathed. We have this illusion just because we spend trillion dollars a year on the military that it's going to be easy dealing with all of these other forces. I assure you it's not. We, in, in the question period, we can talk about the military aspects of it if you want. It looks at the moment, with all the bellowing that's going on in Washington, that we are on a collision course with China. Uh, that hasn't always been the case. After years of thinking that a wealthier new China would surely become more democratic. Because I can still remember the people saying this, oh, they're going to join the world order. They're going to, we're going to bring them into the rules-based system which we, which we chair. 
uh, Washington finally began to realize that this was wishful thinking. As a result, Obama changed course and announced his famous pivot to Asia, a first small step toward offsetting the fast-rising influence of a by then increasingly powerful China. But it was a superficial move, which involved no fundamental, no fundamental rethinking or reordering of America's geopolitical <coughs> priorities. It was a declaratory policy, not a policy. For unlike China, which has very carefully thought through its long-term strategies to achieve its dream of again becoming the center of the world, we seem to have lost our capacity to plan ahead and to shape our policies around the requirements of long-term ends. So we stop thinking. In the new world we live in, that may be a fatal flaw. Now, Trump's disruptive policies, this is not a politically correct lecture, uh, Trump's disruptive policies have made the situation much worse. America first, it turns out, really meant America alone. As he abruptly withdrew the U.S. from multilateral trade and climate change agreements, insulted and snubbed our closest allies, pursued an ambivalent relationship with Russia, and to the consternation of the other signatories, the UK, France, Germany, Russia, and China, abruptly withdrew the US from the carefully negotiated multilateral nu nuclear agreement with Iran, which Tehran has continued to comply with. All this and his affinity for autocrats from Putin and Kim Jong-un to Saudi Arabia's MBS and Hungary's Urban as well as his own erratic and peremptory behavior, have in less than two years erased the admiration and respect America had built up over the long years since World War II. Perhaps most troubling for governments around the world has been the president's reckless and unpredictable management of largely self-generated crises. Like the real estate mogul he is, Trump makes outsized threats, outsized threats, in hopes the other side will panic and fold. When that doesn't happen, he says, okay, why don't we then talk some more? But then, not having prepared the ground, or having read the briefing papers, or having a good enough staff to write briefing papers worth reading, He gets nowhere in the end. That was the pattern in his so far failed high visibility negotiation with Kim Jong-un, who's actually the gainer at this point. He's ahead in this argument. And it's clearly the pattern in the more, faith, more, more faithful and now dangerously escalating trade war with Beijing. Trump's first meeting with Xi Jinping at Mar-a-Lago Mar in April 2017, seemed to signal that we wanted to maintain a calibrated coexistence policy. You know, it was a, it was a sort of happy, clappy, amateurish meeting in a golf resort. And the impression everyone got was, well, that went fairly well. I mean, they didn't fight, no big arguments. So, you know, so far, so good. But the crescendo of American industry complaints, lar very largely justified, about unfair Chinese trade practices and intellectual property theft, led quickly to increasing tensions, to which Trump responded by raising tariffs to 25% on $50 billion worth of Chinese goods in July of last year. Now, you notice we haven't used tariffs much before in our foreign policy. America went through the Krugman wrote a wonderful column about this two days ago, in which he goes back to the 
smooth holly parrot and why why the United States most deliberately got off a tariff war policy. You know, business, you raise me, I raise you, and the end, the end product is it's counterproductive and we all pay for it. Uh, China did not really respond uh, explosively, I suspect because they were anxious to avoid an economic confrontation and that their main objective was not to slow down their own growth. It was, let's deal with this quietly and keep our eyes on the ball. And it was therefore willing to make quite significant concessions in the long, complex negotiations which then ensued. But then, in an abrupt last-minute reversal, a couple of weeks ago, when everyone thought an agreement was so close, you know, all the omens were coming together. Beijing suddenly balked at what the Chinese claimed were new and humiliating American demands. And I, I, I say this with, with hesitation, or at least with qualification. There are some press reports that tend to confirm that. That at, at the last minute, they went in with a new bunch of demands which were way beyond anything the Chinese would be willing to think about. So instead of resuming negotiations and saying, okay, that didn't work, let's get back to, let's go have another lunch and start talking again. The Trump administration angrily raised the ante, massively increasing duties on another 200 billion of Chinese imports to 25%. A move Beijing countered firmly, but I think still rather with some restraint, by raising, our, the t raising tariffs on well over $60 billion worth of U.S. goods. Taken together, it was a mutually reinforcing escalation which would further increase the fast-growing pain for American producers, from Middle Western farmers to Maine lobstermen, the Chinese have stopped buying Maine lobsters, and, divert, and it diverts more Chinese imports to Mexico, Canada, Europe, and elsewhere. In other words, we're the net losers in all of this. <coughs> it was at the height of this tit for tat last month that Trump opened the fateful second front by hitting hard a second front. It was a new offensive by hitting hard at Chinese high-tech firms, which are at the heart of China's long-term plans to gain technological primacy. That was, these are the crown jewels of China's economic planning. And this particularly involved Huawei, the huge low-cost electronics firm, which is favored to build much of the world's next generation 5G networks, which are the most basic layers of next-generation internet communications. The argument, probably well-founded, was that Huawei's 5G networks would be a security risk to industries and defense and intelligence agencies. Although better end-to-end -end encryption of sensitive traffic, one would think, should be able to get around this. I would add one other footnote, if anybody thinks we don't use our technologies to listen to people, <laughs> they're, they're saintly souls. <laughs> um, so, by abruptly blocking Huawei's access to American know-how, abruptly, overnight, and pressuring other countries to follow suit, we just did it again in London, the White House landed a surprise one-two punch clearly intended to rein in China's dominance in next-generation wireless networks and to slow its technological and economic growth, which is at the heart of its long-term plans. For, 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 Xi, for Beijing and for Xi Jinping, this was one step too far.
I mean, this was going for the crown jewels. Almost instantly, the Chinese press took on a new, much harsher and more nationalist tone, making it clear that Beijing was not going to be pushed around. This is underreported in the American press. But if you read the East China Morning Post and you read some of these other things which you can in English, this comes through like a tidal wave. Last Sunday, China made it official with a major white paper. This is very unusual. It was hardly reported in the press. Personally approved by Xi Jinping and, the, and his senior, poli senior political members. It argued eloquently that the two economies are now interdependent. They're saying, Trump, don't you understand? We're interdependent. The tariff and trade wars benefit no one. And we have Xi Jinping lecturing us. And that negotiation is the only wise way to resolve problems and differences. This is remarkable coming from the Chinese addressed to us. At the same time, it made crystal clear that China will resist exorbitant and humiliating demands and is prepared to do so at all costs to the end. In other words, pay attention. And I said that here too. In short, she signaled to Trump, the door is open, but stop throwing your weight around and let's get back to the negotiating table. Before irreparable damage is done to both of our countries and to the world economy. Now, faced with the prospect of real opposition, Trump wobbled and allowed that new trade talks with China might actually resolve all of this after all. And then even the Huawei issue might be included all of a sudden. I can, I can get you the quote. Although, he's, at the same time, he's kept pushing the issue during his UK visit. He clearly hoped he could still make a face-saving deal at a possible meeting with Xi Jinping during the G20 summit in Osaka later this month. And that's the thing to watch, what happens in Osaka. If they resolve, if they really resolve the trade issues and the atmosphere lightens again, uh, we cannot breathe a sigh of relief. <coughs> It, the thing that struck me about all this is that Trump's hand, negotiating hand, is weakening fast. American farmers are being hurt. Stock markets are wobbly, raising fears of another crash. <coughs> and supply chains are being disrupted. Most importantly, the Republican Senate this week, after two years of slavish support, is suddenly revolting. specifically against Trump's latest tariff, abrupt tariff move on Mexico. Yeah, these things come, you know, he comes out of his bedroom and boom, there goes another tariff. Although the underlying frustration in the Senate with Trump's peremptory tariff wars has been building for some time. For no one really wins elections, and this goes for senators as well, with policies that make their home state economies sag. So, hopefully, for all his ongoing bluster and his deteriorating negotiating position, uh, Trump may settle for a more modest deal. In a way, I'm sorry, I screwed this up. Trump, given all of this, let's hope that some set, Trump settles for a more modest deal and gets on with it. Because if we keep on raising in this poker game, it's going to be a disaster. If so, I say that would be good news for all of us. For an economic war with China would deeply damage the world economy, 
and set the stage for even more dangerous confrontation. But the hard truth is that even if we patch things over now, now we're going to the longer term view, this would only be a postponement of a crisis waiting to happen. For even though China benefits greatly from economic interdependence with the U.S., it's obvious long-term policy, and this is the heart of the matter, this is the central point, is focused on slowly but steadily limiting our world role, limiting our world role, and allowing China to become once again the center of the world. This is implicit in Xi Jinping's vast Belt and Road Initiative. How many of you have heard of it? A good number. Yes, yeah, good. His enormous multi-pronged new Chinese investment project aimed at creating a new Beijing-centered world, Beijing-centered world, which would leave the U.S. intact but on the outside looking in. It's a very different challenge from Stalin and the Soviet Union. It's much more subtle, much more longer. For Belt and Road, for the first time in history, links China across the vast spaces of the Eurasian continent with Europe. Think of Marco Polo walking three years to get to China. And we that they can now send Chinese freight to London in eight days on, the, on, the, on these new railways. And they're building new roads, railroads, pipelines, communication things. These projects sub supplement their investment in an equally continent-girdling network of ports, stretching from to China through Sri Lanka and the Indian Ocean to Piraeus in Greece, Trieste in Italy, where they're building a Chinese tourist ship, a cruise ship, Duisburg on the Rhine, and Rotterdam and Amsterdam in Holland, not to mention Djibouti near the Horn of Africa. Massive investments in critical local infrastructure and other major investment projects are being made well across, across Asia, Africa, and even Latin America rapidly creating a vast new space, rapidly creating a vast new space of Chinese influence. As of now, some of these investments are in trouble, although the essentials of Belt and Road, the transportation links, and particularly China's continent-girdling port systems, are clearly stimulating China's global trade and international influence, and creating an evolving new reality a Beijing-centered Eurasia. Four, China is the new economic magnet pulling on Europe, Africa, and Asia. That's the problem. This vast geopolitical gambit, gambit launched by Xi Jinping in 2013, has of course been helped, greatly helped, by American hostility to Russia. We can perhaps talk about this more in that time than with the text. On which we have imposed heavy sanctions, which we keep calling the enemy of the United States. Uh, and we've been greatly damaging its economy. This has inevitably, predictably, driven Moscow much closer to its old enemy, Beijing. You know, if we push on one side, they've got no place to go. They need to do business somewhere. So they go to Beijing. With which it is now not only, a, with, with which it now has not only major energy agreements, Russia is selling them their oil and their gas, Arctic gas, their, the Chinese are exploring <coughs> Arctic gas fields under the ice, but with which Moscow is now increasingly allied militarily, militarily, as well as being a 
China's major partner, of course, in Belt and Rome. It's therefore no surprise that Putin and Xi Jinping are about to meet before the fateful Osaka G20 meeting, no doubt to coordinate their positions uh, before they see Trump in Osaka later this month. A meeting which will probably define where the story goes from there. Xi Jinping understands, of course, that the success of China's long-term policies depend on the continued growth of the Chinese economy, which has been slipping from an amazing 8 to 9 percent to around 6 percent a year, growth a year, which has created worries about social unrest and party control and so forth. What's more, the Chinese, like many of us, are aging. Uh, the one-child policy is kind of wreaking its vengeance. And it's, it sets time constraints in which they feel they must get their thing accomplished. Uh, you know, before China gets too old and wobbly to, to do all this hard work. Given these headwinds, it's still possible, and I, I think that has to be built into the equation, that the Chinese miracle might collapse. Yeah, that's good. It's possible. But the U.S. can't count on that. You know, it's like banking on the stock market going up forever. Yeah. It's possible, but... So... <sighs> Nor are we any longer, and we can develop this point, perhaps further also, we, nor are we any longer in a militarily dominant position in our forward positions in Asia. A fact long recognized by the Pentagon, if you study how carefully they pussyfoot around the East China Sea just enough to get to show that we're there, but not to ever deal with any possible confrontations. It's, it's an optical, it's an optical policy, not a dominant policy. You know, it's, this, it, apparently all of this was true until this week, when our acting Secretary of Defense, who has not even been confirmed yet and who has been given to us by Boeing Corporation, <coughs> announced a much more assertive U.S. military role in the South China Sea and in Taiwan. You know, all of a sudden we, we're going to have muscle. At a meeting he attended with China's top military in Shanghai. Hmm. You know, again, throwing your weight around in this context which we've just been talking about. <clears throat> well, he may have thought that pushing the rawest of all of China's buttons would please his boss. It remains to be seen whether Trump will now rein him in as well to get his China deal, which he badly needs at this point. Trump, of course, may escalate instead. But the wise course for America would be to avoid a cataclysmic crisis with China and to find accommodations and coexist. Indeed, in the longer run, to become an... In this may upset some of you. Indeed, in the longer run, to become an integral part of the emerging new world order, so that it becomes a new interdependent <coughs> Chinese American system. That would require adjustments in our forward positions in the Pacific, <coughs> certainly on Taiwan, as well as in our policies in the, in the, in the region. Instead of abstaining from international, economic, and other agreements, we should join and play active roles in the alphabet soup of China-centric banks and institutions. It was when you're, when you're in the party, you can speak, you can play roles. They don't have exclusive control. You can build alliances. And you can, be, you can to a considerable extent, help shape policy. And that's what happens in international institutions.
we, we should rejoin all the multilateral organizations we have left and so accept and become an important part of the new world order which seems to be emerging. For the fact is, as the Chinese white paper underscores, we are already profoundly interdependent. And so must both learn to adapt and coexist. The alternative will almost inevitably precipitate crisis after crisis and lead to a mutually devastating war, in which, in this age of advanced weaponry, no one will be the winner. That long ago was the fate of Athens and Sparta. They would have been wiser and certainly much better off if they had learned to coexist and had not fought their mutually devastating war. Let's hope we have the wisdom to do better. Can we survive if Trump doesn't get reelected? And second part, can we survive if Trump does get reelected? Look, we know what's going to happen if he stays in power. Can, can people in the back hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 Can, yes. Yes. Can you hear me all Just right? Fine. Yeah. Okay. We, we know what's going to happen if he stays in power. He will go on playing poker. Uh, whether he can keep the Republican support in the Senate endlessly, you know, how long will these guys put up with him? Uh, and more importantly, how long will the voters in Michigan put up with him? You know, these are all questions. Uh, but you know what's going to happen. He's going to, he's going to do more gambits, he's going to launch threats and throw thunderbolts in various directions. And it will be half-baked project, which will not be sustainable. Almost nothing has been in foreign affairs has been sustainable so far. And they will certainly break no new ground, except if people sort of sit on him and they really reach a serious agreement with China after the Osaka summit. You know, that's a big qualification. I'm hoping this might happen. Because the whole world is sick and tired of this tariff game. And, you know, tariffs are on, tariffs are off. I mean, the, the economy doesn't work that way. Now, the, the other part of your question, if I understood it correctly, was what happens to our future if the Democrats win? Or Trump is out? Well, that's an interesting question. We've had a succession of wonderful democratic presidents who have not been terribly good at foreign policy. You, you know, think they understand it, and they actually don't. And being Secretary of State or being Under Secretary of State, for many people, is such a terribly attractive title. You know, it really makes you look important, that people come to these jobs without adequate preparation, and they don't necessarily ask the most searching questions or have the people around them who can find the answers, who can begin to work on the answers. So I think if we keep what we've got, we're in deep trouble. If we change, we might have a chance. That's kind of Yes. Is there anybody that really does? I mean, are there people out there that really do have plans that, that conceivably would work if we get them into alternative positions where they can? Well, I'm sure there are some. Whether there are enough and whether they're willing to come and devote months and years to working, you know, in the swamp and getting things organized again. And 
It's a bit of a question. I'm going, to, I'm going to go way out on the limb. Can, can you all see me over there? No. no. With your indulgence, I'm going to stick my neck out and chop it up if necessary. <laughs> we are a country that has stopped studying history. The people around Dean Atchison knew some history. They may not have been world-class historians, but they knew enough to understand that the management of power is a very serious thing. They were serious people, pretty long-haired people. Uh, you know, I keep meeting these young people who've never heard of anything. And then you meet their parents, and most of them haven't heard of anything present company excluded. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm trying to over, overdo a point. My, my, my great mentor, Charles Burton Marshall, said to me once, he said, you know, a nation has to have a sufficiency, sufficiency of men or women and there, was, there were a couple of women on the policy planning side, uh, to meet the problems of the day. In other words, you've got to produce, you don't have to produce battalions of people who can do this. But the nation needs a resource pool of serious people who have thought about this stuff. For and, and the people that the Americans will listen to. That's the next step. But when things, there are turning points in history, and we're at one of them now, just like after the end of World War II, when really serious long-term thinking and fundamental decision-making would benefit us enormously. You know, they published these thick, top-secret defense reviews on this, that, and the other thing, and all kinds of official secret papers, and they're full of paragraphs and footnotes and this, this, and that. Great policy you can usually sum up on one page, because it's simple wisdom. Policy of containment you can summarize on one page. Let them push against us, that was it. The rest was all detail, okay? Yes, please. Possibly, yeah, um, possibly since the uh, 1880s, this country became self-conscious about wanting to be number one worldwide. And that has just increased through the decades. What motivates that? Why is it that we're so obsessed with being, or engaged with being number one in the world? Oh, that's a wonderful and complicated question. The answer is complicated. And I'm not sure I've got it all, but I think it's that bad. Part of it was our competition with England. We had gone out from under. They had tried to give us one last punch in 1812. We had managed to teach them to bugger off. And we were going to show these Europeans. You know, we were different. Uh, and this was kind of a raw drive. Teddy Roosevelt, uh, you know, this whole business of collecting American colonies, and building an American Navy. Uh, it was kind of, it, it was not that we were threatened by anybody. It's hard to threaten, it was hard to threaten a country between two oceans. In the, in, the, in the late 19th century, uh, if you had any kind of a navy. But, but we were just anxious to show them, you know, now it's our turn. You've had your turn. You pushed us around, and now we're going to push you around a little bit. And the saving grace, in a way, in a perverse and terrible way, were the two world wars. When the U United Kingdom desperately needed our help. The same Brits who had been our masters once upon a time. And here, they, here was Churchill having sleepless nights wondering whether he can persuade Roosevelt to do it in time. <coughs> you know, this, this was, 
So there was a great turning point in, involved in these two world wars in which we reintegrated into, for the first time, actually not reintegrated, but we for the first time became part of a larger world order. The Atlantic Charter sort of was the baptism of this new document, of this new world. And they put an end to the swashbuckling, you know, rough rider stuff, uh, which was a pretty hard edge at various times. Um, and then we covered ourselves with glory in a way which the 19th century guys didn't really understand or expect. And they were still kind of raw imperialists. Uh, and what ended up was we did become, for a good 50 years, the people the world admired most. Now, you know, I'm, I'm old enough, I'm 93 years old, and I was in World War II, and I served in Europe for decades in the diplomatic service. And, you know, I, I can sit here and tell you with a perfectly straight voice, we were loved. We were appreciated, our government was admired, and, you know, some of our behavior always was bad. Vietnam was a horrible exception. But by and large, you know, Americans, the doors were open for us. And then we overdid it again in the last 15, 20 years. And that's a bipartisan failure. Um, does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. Well, this gentleman was next time. The uh, <clears throat> main motivating thing of the Cold War was military might and nukes. And it sort of uh, fashioned our thinking for a long time. Uh, to what extent do we need to be frightened of China military? Okay, but the, the, those are two separate but very important questions. Mm -hmm. Look, let's, and this is where precision is important. Yes, in the Cold War, we had a sort of ongoing balance of nuclear terror. You know, we all went to the bomb shelters, and the little kids went, we were told to get under the school tables and be safe there, total baloney. Um, and, you know, People like myself, in, in my profession, uh, some of us work very hard on curbing the proliferation of nuclear weapons and of limiting the numbers of nuclear weapons. And we can talk about that as well. So it was not just the balance of terror, it was also a period in which people from all sides, including the Russians, the Soviets, we're actively engaged in negotiating with us about how you can bring the numbers of weapons down, how you can limit we nuclear weapons testing, etc., etc. Uh, stuff that is now being has now been forgotten and it runs a great risk of being undone, undone, uh, because we can talk about that as well. But the, the heart of the Cold War was not the nuclear balance, that was the insurance policy. The heart of the Cold War was the alliance. That was a political and human fact. And, you know, much as the Europeans make fun of us these days, or dislike us these days, uh, in, you know, at the time, we were the chairman of the system. At all these levels. And the Europeans and we pulled together, and yes, the French misbehaved, as only the French can. <laughs> uh, you know, they disrupted more meetings than I can remember. But that said, when push comes to shove, they too would come around. And they go on, but they go on. Um, so it was in the first place a political thing, a human thing, of which the military thing was kind of the overarching 
framework. What seems to have happened is that famous quote from Eisenhower about the industrial, military industrial complex. Oh, I'm going to get into, into the real weeds here. Uh, can you stand it if I back up a little bit? Sure. Um, <coughs> we talked briefly about the policy planning staff and how these were 14 or 15 people of distinction who worked very hard thinking things through. Harry Truman, bless his heart, thought it was important, and it was, that the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense and the head of the CIA and the Treasury and two or three others all understood that we were singing off the same page so they wouldn't go off in different directions. And that's why he pushed for having the National Security Council Act in, passed by Congress, which established the National Security Council, which as he conceived it, was simply a cabinet committee of various cabinet secretaries plus a very tiny little secretarial staff to take notes and sharpen pencils and follow up and see that what these eminences decided would then actually be promulgated across the system. Okay, I, I'm, I'll get to the point, you'll see. The National Security Council was too attractive a place to work. It was too close to the seat of power. And the notion of coordinating policy, my God, I mean, isn't that wonderful if you could sit there and chair a little committee that was coordinating policy on some major issue and you could go to your next cocktail party and they would all want to know what happened including the New York Times, uh, it's good stuff. Good job, we get it. So, for all these reasons, uh, it didn't stay a little coordinating committee. The National Security staff is now, uh, consists of something like three to four hundred highly qualified ego trippers. <laughs> I, I say that seriously, they are, they are highly qualified, they have all the pedigree. But examine what they now do. Under the National Security Council, you then have developed and sprung up a whole family tree of lesser committees. And on all these committees, you had to have a lieutenant colonel and a Navy captain and a CIA guy pretending to be from the State Department, <laughs> and a State Department guy pretending to be a State Department guy, <laughs> you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then you had this head chairman who was working in the White House, and he was coordinating. Now what happens when you all sit around the table and there are three from the Pentagon, one from intelligence, one from the State Department, it becomes a numbers game. The Pentagon people, by and large, on most issues, will have coordinated their positions. The State Department still has a little prestige, but frequently not enough to prevail. The CIA plays its own game. And the Treasury has other interests. Now, when you multiply this for two or three hundred little committees that you never hear of, all of whom are feeding stuff upstairs, you get a very different thing from the old policy planning stuff that in which it was okay to disagree with each other, in which the idea was to search for answers that were true and sensible and not to win the argument. In coordinating committees, it's usually winning the argument that's important. It's what uh, my boss, who's not here today, wants me to come back with. That's what frequently is all about. And that's why it's a terrible way to make policy. That's a long, long-winded answer to a very short, important question. My question is whether we have to worry about China militarily. Oh, that's the other part of your question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Chinese and American interests 
and weapons systems are asymmetric. They're asymmetric. I keep like, looking at this side and keep neglecting this side over here. That's very impolite of me. Um, Your speaker works quite well. It does it? Okay. Um, asymmetric. Keep that in mind. We are, we ended up in forward positions in the Pacific at the end of World War II when China was in shambles. It was nothing. And we were the only force, and the only force who could, in that terribly war-torn region. We rebuilt Japan, we gave it some kind of new constitution, we gave them that self-respect back, and built a democratic Japan, more or less, um, um, so we, we did a lot of good out there. We have gotten used to being there. In, in other words, we, we've been there now since 1944, you know, 43. And along comes China, and they, as we, as we pointed out in the talk, they come rising out of the ashes. And they think this is their part of the world. Think Monroe Doctrine. They think this is their part of the world. It's an original idea. And we say, like hell, we have established an international border. We're the ones who, although we've never signed the law of the seas, we're the stalwart defender of the law of the seas. We have every right to be in these open oceans. They don't belong to you. Uh, and the Chinese sort of think about this and say, well, we've been around here for 3,000 years. You've been around here since 1950. You know, it looks different when you look at the other guy's cultural way of thinking about something. So that's the background. So we had dug in on Taiwan, which is sort of a military ally, and as our acting defense secretary so elegantly put it, we're going to push the, the Taiwan issue harder now, in, in your face. They say, look, Taiwan is part of China. It's a breakaway province. It's our business, it's not your business. So, we are, let's put it this way, because of the rise of China, the situation which brought us there at the end of World War II no longer exists. However, we're saying we're now here by right of agreements, international law, the history that has evolved over the last 50 or 60 years with Japan, with Taiwan, with all these countries in the Pacific. And you're not going to, we're not going to let you take that away from us. And the Chinese sort of say, we'll see. So what they do is, in typically Chinese fashion, do, do, do any of you ever watch somebody play the game of Go? With a lot of little balls on a chest, on a board. And the idea is to surround your enemy until he can't move anymore. It's not to take the king, it's to surround him, or corner him, or her. It's a very complex game. And so what they do, they start building little artificial islands. They say, ah, but that's Chinese territory now, sovereignty. 200 miles. And we go driving destroyers through tooting our horn. And we say, like hell, international law says we have a right to be there. <laughs> okay. So that's the geographic problem in the Taiwan Straits in the South China Sea. How does this asymmetric situation play out militarily? We have a powerful fleet of carrier battle groups, submarines, destroyers, all that stuff, based in part in Okinawa and in Japan, partly in Hawaii, but ultimately home-based in California. 
that's 8,000 miles away. We have intercontinental ballistic missiles. What the Chinese are not trying to, what Xi Jinping keeps saying to us is, look, I'm not trying to destroy you. We just want to be able to do our thing, so don't get in our way. And this is reflected in their military hardware policy. We have this enormous military establishment. The Chinese, for various reasons, have a smaller one that's differently configured. The Chinese have only 250 or so intercontinental ballistic missiles. Only 250. We have 1,500 nuclear equipped. Strike it. Uh, they have that intercontinental SCBM force because they need it in order to make it clear to us that we cannot just nuke them into eternity, that we'll go with them. You know, 250 missiles can take out, let's say, conservatively, 10 American cities. That's not too nice a thought. So it's an, that's enough, that's what's called a deterrent. But their main missile force, 800 some medium and shorter range missiles, form a belt around China. That's where the emphasis is. Don't screw with us in our part of the world. So when I said earlier in the talk that our Navy has been fairly cognizant of the fact that they're not in a superior position when they're driving battleships around in the Taiwan Strait, or even in 600 miles away. That was not an oratorical flourish, that was the actual truth, because all these ships are precisely targeted by satellites, that's coordinated with missile launching systems, so that every one of these ships is a moving missile target. How we expect to win a war at that distance, in that sort of situation, uh, are we going to take out 800, or let's say 400, Chinese medium and long, medium range missiles, instantly, simultaneously? No. So what they've built themselves is a safety zone for a real war. And what they're saying to us, they said, look, we're not going to have a war, war is very bad, so let's play the game within limits, tolerable limits. You drive through the Taiwan Strait, we'll scream at you, but we're not going to shoot at you. That's a big difference. Uh, we start See, the great risk in this is that at some point, some ship will actually shoot something off, or they will collide and sink or hit a mine. And at that point, you've got a national crisis in this country. There'll be screams in the Senate, you know, we, this is an act of war, and you're off to the races. Or the other way. Or the you other way. Yes. Yes. So, and I'm not sure that really answers your question, but it's, it's a big question. The answer is not so much, but yes. <laughs> yes, sir. It was mentioned earlier in the 1880s or so, we wanted to prove we were number one. We built a great white fleet and all that. Until World War I, when the, we went and helped in Europe, how did we and the British avoid having the kind of conflict we're talking about now between ourselves and China? I think because the Germans were the more important problem for them. It, that may be a simplistic answer, but when you look at British history during the first part of the century and the last part of the 19th century, they were intensely concerned about Bismarck's and the Kaiser's shipbuilding program. And they weren't going to go horse around with the United States and pick fights 
with people who weren't going to attack them uh, out of ego trip reasons or whatever. So I think the answer to your question is Germany. Thank you. Maybe somebody from this side. And last question, but everybody's welcome to hang out and chat with George afterwards. Go ahead. I think the other answer to that question was uh, at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, uh, the United Kingdom was also more interested in carving up Africa and other parts of the world uh, than it was in locking horns of the United States. My question deals with um, the rise of the economic power of China, to which you alluded. And unless they have internal uh, dissension, which slows it down or sends it uh, into chaos, <coughs> Um, do you see any role for the World Bank or the IMF in the future? Yes, I am very glad you asked that. <clears throat> you know, in the last two years, we've been fleeing all these international institutions. I think we're still in the World Bank, but we're, yes, we we're getting out of as many as fast as we can manage. In connection with Belt and Road and the general expansion of Chinese economic policy, foreign economic policy. The Chinese have built a whole, as I put it in the talk, a whole sort of alphabet soup of institutions. The Asian Development Bank and the this and the that and the other thing. There are about six or eight of them. Yeah. And these are, these are basically committees of all these major, of the major participants in the built and road world that, yeah. You know, who then get to play a role because the Chinese, the Chinese are clever. They're, they're not going to say, we're going to colonize you. This is our joint effort. Okay? And so it is. It is. So, you know, it's, Chinese power is not able to dictate terms all over Asia. They need collaboration. So, my and this, this is not an original idea with me. But there is a whole school of thought which I am sympathetic to, which argues that we would, would have been very wise when we were invited to join all this stuff. If instead of sticking our nose up and saying, you go play in your sand pile, if we had from the outset joined these organizations, <coughs> and played a pretty heavy role, because we are the United States. I tend to think that even though we have let this go, part of the overarching deal with China, or the beginnings of a process of dealing with China, might be that we reverse that at attitude. And not only join all these organizations, but begin playing a active and intelligent role in them. Basically saying, okay, you're building a new thing here, we'll be part of it. Which doesn't cost us very much. And is much better than if we, by, by choice, exclude from ourselves from this and build two worlds that are not, in, not connected. Hmm? Yeah. So, that's, that's the point. Instead of saying we don't want you there, let's work That's what, that's the end product. And the U.S. is big enough as an economy and as a power that if we are in all these committees, A, we'll learn a lot. You know, long distance learning when you're not part of a system, it's pretty Scruffy. <laughs> uh, you know, when you're in these organizations, you talk to everybody, you talk to the Thais, and you talk to the Turks, and you talk to this one and that one, and the Chinese. And the, you, you become part of the scene, okay? That's very different of relationships, and when you're the stranger on the outside being, being stiff-necked, which is the way we're playing it now. We're saying that's your system, and you're competing with us, and that's bad, and we're going to defeat you someday. That's the message that's coming out. I have a fantasy for all of us. <laughs>
if you know something for interesting, if we know more about it than anybody else. Yeah. And then it does something to offend people, you know, you shut down because you think you know more than anybody else. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you all very much for coming. I'll see you next week to discuss the First Amendment. Let's have a big hand for George. Thank you all so much.